Hello, welcome to the interview here on France 24. Well, if Vladimir Putin has a dartboard in his Kremlin office, my guest today might be the bullseye. Uh, a decade ago, Bill Browder was one of the most successful foreigners doing business in Russia. His high-flying investment fund, Hermitage Capital, was a showcase for opportunities in newly privatized companies. Now, today, almost eight years after being banned from Russia, the U.S.-born businessman is on a mission to showcase a darker side of Russia, a country of endemic corruption, cover-ups, and human rights abuses. Now, the turning point, he says, was the beating death in a Russian jail of his uh, lawyer, Sergei Magnitsky. Uh, Browder successfully lobbied the U.S. Congress to pass what's called the Magnitsky Act, which blacklists Russian officials implicated in severe human rights abuses. And now, he's in Europe, here in France, trying to get the same thing passed on the books here. Welcome to our studios. Thank you. I'm going to get to your reason for being here in France, but I want to start with Magnitsky himself. This was your lawyer, a man you knew, close friend as well. Tell me about the time you learned of his death in a Russian jail in 2009. You knew things had been getting bad for him, going from bad to worse. You were told, basically, he was found in a pool of his own urine, uh, beaten by guards uh, with uh, rubber batons. It changed your whole life. Yeah, on the morning of the 16th of November, uh, actually 17th of November 2009, I um, uh, got a phone call from one of our Russian lawyers um, uh, very early in the morning um, with this news that Sergei Magnitsky had died. And it was like a knife going right into my heart. Sergei had been taken hostage, essentially, by a group of corrupt Russian government officials after he had exposed a major government corruption scheme involving the theft of $230 million. The Russians said accused him of tax evasion. But what happened was he discovered a major uh, a, a corruption scheme in uh, 2008. He exposed it. He testified against the officials. And then the officials who he testified against arrested him, put him in pretrial detention, and then began to torture him to get him to withdraw his testimony. And they did some really horrific things to him. They put him in cells with 14 inmates and eight beds and left lights on 24 hours a day, put him in cell with, with, with no heat in, in December in Moscow, and nearly froze to death. And just to be sure, despite a noise as early on, the Russians saying, uh, I think Medvedev, the, uh, the now prime minister, saying, we will thoroughly investigate, to this day, they deny that version of, of how he died. They still say it was a heart attack. Well, essentially, they said he died of death. He died of death after being tortured for a long period of time and then beaten on the last night of his mm -hmm. life. And, and those facts are not in dispute. There have been four independent studies of what happened to him. It's all clear, it's all definitive, and it's all documented. And so um, essentially what the Russian government is, is that they're in a quandary because this is different than other murders in, in Russia. It's not like we're asking them to investigate. Everybody knows what happened. We're asking them to prosecute the people where there's evidence of their involvement. And there's a lot of people involved. Now, you did something that almost no one else, I don't think anyone else before you actually dared to do. You went and lobbied very strongly and very persistently the U.S. Congress at a time when the U.S. was trying to put its relations with Russia on a reset, back on track. There's a lot of resistance. You broke them down. They passed the Magnitsky Law last month. What does this law mean now? It's on the books. Well, the Magnitsky Law does, does several things. It, it names names, freezes assets, and bans visas for the people who killed Sergei Magnitsky and the people who commit other gross human rights abuses from Russia. It's, it's, a, it's a monumental, revolutionary... How many people are on the list right now, do you... Well, as of two years ago, there were about 60 people who were responsible for Magnitsky's death. That list has now widened, um, mm -hmm. and, we're, and the, it's the U.S. government that will ultimately determine how many people are on that list. So it hasn't really been put to the test yet. If one of those officials tomorrow decides, packing their bags, I'm going to go on a trip to the U.S., you don't quite know what the reaction will be. Well, if they show up in the U.S., I think that, that all um, pandemonium will break loose in the Congress because this, this law was a, was a, is, is now on, on, the, on the official law book. It's U.S. law. It's yeah. U.S. law. It's, 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 it's a part of the, the uh, code of, of the United States. And so if, if, if these people are allowed to still travel in, into America after this law has been passed, Something is seriously wrong with, with the, the way the laws are implemented in America. Now, you're here in France today um, to launch, officially, your Magnitsky campaign. You want to see French legislators do essentially a carbon copy of the law we just saw passed in America. And, and the reason you, you chose France is because, I, I believe you say, this is a playground for what you call Russian criminals, this country. Um, th this is the, it, it, France is where all of the Russian high-level government officials, the corrupt government officials, have homes where they travel, where they're 
mistresses travel, where they go shopping. Mm -hmm. If you go down to the south of France between Monaco and Saint-Tropez, just about every one of the frontline homes is owned by a Russian or a Kazakh or some, some similar type of person. This is what they care about most. And so we want to make sure that, that, that the people who are doing this stuff mm. can't come to France. And that will touch them. Uh, well, I was going to say, you, I mean, if you faced resistance in the U.S., I mean, there's a lot of money, right, being brought by these rich Russians to the, Fran to the French economy. I imagine you're going to face a lot of resistance in this country. Well, yes and no. I think there's also a lot of people down in the south of France that would not, you know, that, that have seen them ruin the place. And, and I, I, I'm not talking about Russians generally. I'm talking about a certain subgroup of Russians, criminals working in the regime of Putin. We're not talking about the large group of Russians. We're talking about a small group of Russians um, on a targeted basis shouldn't be allowed here. And I think that, that, that this is a country which is actually, you know, has a very long history of uh, mm. egalité, fraternité, et cetera. Um, it's got to mean something here. So, so you're hopeful at this point that it will perhaps not be as uphill a struggle as it was in the U.S. getting this law passed. Well, in, in the U.S., we had, to do, we, ha we had to establish all the facts. The, the facts have been established by, and, and approved and vetted um, by the U.S. government. And they have the best mm. intelligence resources of any place in the world. And so if, 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 they've, if they've concluded that, that this version of events was the right version of events, um, it's now just a question of what policy should be applied to, that, to that, these set of facts. In order to follow through. Bill, let me ask you this. Your grandfather was an American communist, ran twice for president. Your sort of form of rebellion, as I understand it, was to do just the opposite. You want to be the first big capitalist in Russia. Go there, show the opportunities in the new Russia. Do you still believe, because you soured very quickly on it, you used to sing the praises of Russia and its investment opportunities. Are you completely soured on it now? Forget what happened to your former lawyer, the actual business climate. The, 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 well, I can't forget what happened to my, my former lawyer. It's all no, part I, of one package. But what I can say is that that case and many other cases like it have proved that, that the, the rule of law, property rights, and governance has completely broken down in Russia. It's, it's a, essentially a criminal state now. It's, it's, a, it's a sovereign state run by a group of criminals. And it, it's uninvestable as a, for a businessman. And, and not only do you risk losing your money, um, but you risk having people killed. And no responsible business person can go to Russia and, and, and put people in harm's way like that. But wasn't it like that even in the years when your, your fund at one point, Hermitage Capital, that had, I think, $4.5 billion under management, wasn't it already like that early on? I mean, I said a decade ago is when it was at its peak. Didn't you have some early warning signs, uh, you know, well before uh, Magnitsky's murder? Well, Russia at the time when I first got there was what I would call a chaotic country. It was chaos, but it was disorganized and disorganized crime. Mm. And so if you kept your head down and if you kept stayed out of harm's way, you could go there and you could have a business and, and do well. What's happened since Putin has taken power is that he's taken all the power away from the other oligarchs and become the biggest oligarch and become a criminal oligarch in the process. And now it's not disorganized crime, it's highly organized crime where anybody who goes there mm -hmm. will be shaken down by Putin and, and the guys around big, him. Big, small, medium sized, it doesn't matter. And if, if you're big, you'll be shaken down by Putin. If you're small, you'll be shaken down by a mini Putin. It's interesting. Uh, Putin, now president, Dmitry Medvedev, former president, now prime minister. There were some remarks that Medvedev reportedly made privately off the record at the recent Davos summit where he said, and I'm quoting this, it's a shame that Sergei Magnitsky died and Bill Browder is still uh, free and alive. When you heard that, what was your reaction? Because Medvedev had been earlier saying he wanted to investigate and get to the bottom of this. Well, it sounded like the, the words of, of, a, of a deranged or desperate man, except that the problem is that, that he's the prime minister of the Russian Federation. And, um, you know, the, the way that everybody is sort of flocking around him makes, you know, one has to, one has to take that seriously if he's, a, 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 you know, the... He's a prime minister, but a prime minister, most people say, without any effective power. Well, he, I mean, he's really a spokesman for Putin. He's not a real prime minister. Um, he's not even a real man, as far as I can tell. But, but he is, you know, um, officially the prime minister of the Russian Federation. Do you hold out any hope right now? I mean, given all the tragedy of the circumstances surrounding Magnitsky, what you've been through in Russia, do you hold out any hope or do you, are you at least given op grounds for optimism, seeing the protests, seeing this new generation? Do you see an alternative to Putin? Well, I, I, I don't know what the alternative is, um, but there has to be an alternative. And, and I think that there's very likely um, going to be a change of government at some point for one simple reason. You can't have a person running a country um, stealing all the money from the country and not have any ideology to back it up. I mean, there's no reason why 
141 million Russians should tolerate the thousand Russians who are stealing all the money from the country. And eventually that's got to break. And I think it breaks, not necessarily with the opposition, it breaks when the oil prices start going down. So, so the oil prices, in a sense, have been Putin's cover until now. It, it, that's the only thing that's kept him going. I just want to, I, I want to ask you this. Inevitably, you have, uh, you know, given what happened to your own lawyer, Sergei Magnitsky, you've seen what has have happened to other high profile, high profile people who've criticized the Kremlin. Do you ever fear retribution? Do you ever find yourself looking over your own shoulder, afraid that someone somewhere is going to come after you? Well, it, it, it's it's certain that they're thinking about that because Medvedev said it said it in Davos, and mm -hmm. um, you know, is that going to stop me from pursuing justice for what they did to Sergei Magnitsky? No, it's not. I'm not going to be cowed by their threats. Um, but you know, it could happen. And yet, you you would go back to Russia. You love you like the country. I wouldn't go back to Russia while this current regime is in power, but I would I would go, be glad to go back to Russia when this regime has, has been um, changed. Bill Browder, um, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts today. You are here in France uh, trying to launch here in Europe, in France, your campaign to pass a Magnitsky Act, uh, a law that would essentially punish or ban Russian uh, officials, freeze their assets, those uh, implicated in severe human rights abuses, any sort of torture, other such crimes. Thank you very much for your time. Good luck to you. And thank you. Thanks to all of you for uh, watching the interview here on France Fancat.